Hello and welcome to the companion audio to today's lesson on colonialism. Today's lesson we're going to be doing a little bit of history and looking at how the concept of colonialism could be applied to uh, this course in world issues. Today's lesson we're going to be doing a few things. Um, first of all, I'm going to be doing a brief uh, tracing of the history of colonialism. Um, obviously, we're not going to go into too much detail with this. We're going to go through some of the basic facts and basic history behind um, what we know as colonialism today. Um, but you could do a whole course on this. So uh, our, our scope is going to be kind of limited in, in what we're going to be discussing. Um, then we're going to be looking at a little bit of, at the idea of decolonization, uh, a more recent phenomenon, uh, post-World War II especially, um, that really ties into um, some of the issues that we've been discussing in this unit with geopolitics. Um, the third thing we're going to do is we're going to briefly talk about the idea of post-colonialism, which is an academic discipline which seeks to uh, study events and study issues uh, through the lens of living in a post-colonial society. And then finally, at the end of the lesson today, I'm going to be talking about uh, the idea of the progress trap, which is uh, part of a reading that you're going to be doing uh, later on this week. So one question you might be asking yourself is why in a world issues class are we studying colonialism? Um, as I had mentioned at the start of this course, um, really ties together a lot of different threads academically. Yes, it's a geography course that we're doing here, but there are aspects of history um, that are woven throughout it. And it's really important to understand those things going forward, to understand the way the world works today. Um, for one thing, colonialism, we could really look at it as sort of the beginnings of globalization, which is another topic that we're going to be getting into in the next few days. Um, in terms of colonial empires and the age of exploration, um, it's really the first time where we start to see the beginnings of a, a world uh, that's interconnected. People can travel all over the world. People are, you know, understanding of these connections and these exchanges between different people and different places that had never been in contact before. And those have some very uh, important connections to what we're going to be studying here in the present day. It's also important to understand the legacies of colonialism. So, for example, um, if we were to look at places that are colonized or that were colonized 100 years ago, many of those countries, especially in places like Africa and the in Southeast Asia, uh, those are what we would look at as developing countries today or lesser developed countries. So we can still see those legacies of colonialism living on today, as well as some of the legacies of racism that we might look at and discuss in current uh, current issues. And then finally, just studying the idea of power dynamics, looking at how that's affected between the colonizer and the colonized. So just to start off here, we have a definition of what colonialism is. It's just a textbook definition. It says the it's the establishment, exploitation, maintenance, acquisition, and expansion of a colony in one territory by a political power from another territory. Um, in essence, this is talking about one place, a powerful country that is exerting its will on another place, making it part of its empire. Uh, and this often leads to an unequal power relationship. In fact, it is an unequal power relationship. Um, the colonizer, the empire, has they, they rule the colony. Colonizers build empires using a variety of methods. Um, it could be by force. You take over a land through either warfare or the threat of warfare. It could be through coercion or it could be through business interests, having an economic advantage on uh, lesser countries. So again, we can, we can trace this idea back a long ways. We can trace it to ancient empires, some of which you may have heard of uh, or come across in previous studies. Empires like the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, um, they're all great examples of empires. They held cultural, economic, and military control over huge territories um, for long periods of time. Now, while there are many uh, similarities between these ancient and modern empires, there are some very distinct uh, differences that we want to keep in mind going forward. Um, but the reason I wanted to bring this up is that uh, clearly colonialism and imperialism, they are not new phenomena. They've been around for centuries. Um, 
just to give you a little bit of, uh, just to give you an example here. So the Egyptian Empire, um, this is this picture here is showing uh, Egypt at its greatest extent in the 15th century BC. Again, we're, we're tracing this back now thousands of years. And you can see here Egypt is uh, at the height of its empire, controls large areas of northern Africa and the Middle East, what we would know them as today. This is during the time of like the pharaohs, uh, when the pyramids were built. Um, so you might have heard of some of these things and studied them in other courses in the past. The slide here is talking about the Roman Empire at its greatest extent in 117 AD. You can see uh, Rome controlled um, large stretches of what we now know as Europe uh, into northern Africa and parts of the Middle East. Um, Rome is considered one of the largest and most powerful empires in history. Um, in fact, at one point it got too big. So at this point you can see here, um, such a large geographic territory it was very difficult at the time to actually be able to rule such a large territory. Um, so at different points, it actually became almost split into east and west. Um, this is the, the reason for this is because of, uh, again, limits to travel and technology at the time that made it difficult to control uh, such a large area. But there was actually capitals uh, in the east, which actually evolved eventually into the Byzantine Empire and, and the west. Um, and this is cited by some historians, one of the reasons for the collapse of the Roman Empire. Now, when we get into modern colonialism, what we often think of as uh, imperialism today, we're talking about, um, this, is, this is a phenomenon which starts in the, the late 15th century um, with the Age of Discovery. So while ancient empires gave us a glimpse of how um, they might look. This is really the first time when um, we start to see colonialism as we know it today. And we can divide it into two distinct waves. The first wave of colonialism begins with the Age of Discovery. The first colonies were started uh, by Spanish and Portuguese explorers in the late 15th and early 16th century. So they conquered land in the New World. So at this time, uh, colonialism is European powers uh, coming over and, and finding territory in the Americas in North America and South America. And this is with the establishment of trading posts, so trading with the natives, meeting natives, um, and settling the area, bringing uh, immigrants over from Europe to, to live in these new areas. So for example, perhaps the most famous is, is Columbus um, setting sail and landing in the Caribbean uh, in the late 1400s. So we're gonna talk more about Columbus uh, in a later lesson. So I don't want to get too much into him today, but uh, just a little brief background on him. So in 1492, famous saying, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And it's often, uh, again, he, he's often portrayed as discovering the new world. And there, are, uh, it's a problematic language to use because obviously people had, you know, there were native peoples living in the Americas for for centuries before Columbus got here. In fact, Columbus wasn't even the first European to, to, to make landfall in the Americas. There's evidence of the Vikings landing in Newfoundland uh, hundreds of years before Columbus. Um, so th there's this whole history of Columbus being uh, portrayed as you know a hero and portrayed as the discoverer of the New World when really that's not exactly what happened. Um, and in fact, um, there's definitely a, a dark side to Columbus. Um, he knew slaves, he brought slaves over to the Americas, uh, committed genocide against the natives, um, waged war. It's, he's not necessarily the, the great guy that he's been portrayed as throughout history. Um, we'll talk more about him later, though. Just want to point out really quick, um, there's a video that you're going to be watching. Um, this is from Crash Course. Um, on the Columbian Exchange. Uh, and again, this is just the beginnings. It really, really ties into the beginnings of what we know as globalization today. Um, the Columbian Exchange, the, the video goes into this in more detail, but um, it, it's talking about an exchange of people, an exchange of animals, an exchange of plants, and an exchange of disease between these two worlds meeting each other, Europeans and natives. Um, so make sure you watch that video to, to get more, de more detail on the topic. 
So again, the first wave of colonialism, it's starting really with Columbus in 1492, and it's, it lasts for a couple centuries. Um, and eventually the other European major powers start to get involved. So you see the British, uh, they start colonies in Australia, in Canada, the United States, in India, um, the French coming to Canada in the South Pacific, Spain setting up uh, colonies in the southern U.S. and in Mexico and in South America, and really all the other major European powers, they all want a hand in this. They see this as an economic opportunity and a way to spread their hegemony throughout the world. And so you've probably heard of some of these explorers before, but these are the famous people who are held up by, um, you know, in history as these famous explorers who discovered the new world for Europeans. So, for example, Magellan. Uh, the first person to circumnavigate the world. So this map here is just showing his his voyage, the first person to um, go around the world. You can see him starts his voyage here, gets to take a route around South America and around the Cape of Good Hope and ends up back, uh, back in Spain. Amerigo uh, Vespucci, who is the man who America actually gets its namesake from, North and South America, the United States of America, actually named after this man, um, gets less credit than Columbus. Um, a bit of a, again, he has some of the less baggage than, than Columbus might have, according to some historians. Um, another name that might be familiar to you, Jacques Cartier. Um, in the 1500s, he's a French explorer. He comes and he um, he comes to what we now know as Quebec, uh, tries to start a colony there, but is unsuccessful. It was not a permanent settlement, um, but it's the first attempt to start a colony in Canada. In 1608, Samuel de Champlain, another French explorer, um, he started the first permanent settlement in Canada, um, set, uh, founded, the, founded what we now know as Quebec City. So he carried out many expeditions further inland, too. So initially he finds the mouth of the St. Lawrence and uh, founds Quebec. But um, he had many uh, interactions um, with native tribes and, and went very much further inland than just Quebec. Again, this is the first permanent settlement of the New World by the French, of, of, of Quebec, and what we now know as Canada, I should say. Um, and again, we start to see this kind of connection and this exchange between Europeans and natives. So, for example, he's starting to make uh, alliances with native tribes. So, for example, the Huron and Algonquin were his, uh, two of his main allies, and um, the French actually were allied with them in different conflicts against their rivals, um, namely the Mohawk. And at this time, again, even though they are the colonizers coming from Europe, at this point, it, it, even though there's this uneven power dynamic, um, the French are really relying on the natives in many ways. They're, they're trading with them, um, trading things like beaver pelts, um, but they're also relying on them to keep their colonies stable and safe. Again, this is at a time where you can't just order something and ship it across the Atlantic. That takes months and months to get supplies over there. So the Europeans are really heavily reliant on natives at this time for these colonies to get uh, going, especially in a harsh climate like, like it, we have in Canada. Another famous explorer, so Captain Cook, uh, he's a British explorer who uh, explored the South Pacific, um, what we now know as, like, for example, Hawaii. Um, an interesting historiography behind his death, actually. Um, he tried to kidnap the Hawaiian king and actually was killed in the process. And the way that history has viewed this, again, looking at the natives uh, very primitively, um, when in reality you can kind of see why, you know, that might be a problematic way of looking at things, looking at it through that Eurocentric lens. Um, historians today are looking at that story from, from different angles and seeing maybe maybe it wasn't savages who went and killed Captain Cook. Uh, there might have been another side to the story. And finally, Henry Hudson, the man that the Hudson's Bay is named after. His picture here is of uh, him being mutinied off of his ship. And so 
at this point, colonialism is it, it's more or less relegated to the Americas. You can see here on this map, um, by the mid-1700s, the vast majority of North and South America have been colonized by different powers. And you can see Spain holds large territories in, in South America and uh, Central America and in Mexico, also the southern U.S. Um, France has a huge territory in what's now the United States and in Canada. Um, and the British have some territory around the Hudson Bay. And by the early 1800s, this is what the map looks like. So again, most of the Americas have been colonized with some remote areas in northern Canada. Um, they haven't yet been colonized. But you can see here in Africa and in South Asia, um, these areas, there isn't a lot of action going on there. It's really relegated to the coastlines. And some historians, um, they've argued that this is because Europeans were unable to conquer these inland tribes. They weren't able to, um, you know, they weren't able to coerce their way with military force to establish colonies in Central Africa and in Central Asia. Um, so whereas in the Americas, they had the advantage of smallpox, uh, a pandemic which wiped out, by some estimates, 90% of the native population, uh, they didn't have that advantage in Africa. Um, and in many ways, they were at, um, on, on an even playing field technologically in terms of weaponry. Um, so it was very difficult for European powers to establish colonies early on. But that picture is about to change very quickly. Because this is what the map looks like by, uh, by the start of World War I. You can see Africa has been almost entirely colonized. Um, so how does this happen? So this is really when we start to see what historians would call the second wave of colonization, second wave imperialism, also known as new imperialism. Um, so this is an increased competition, a renewal in that competition between the European powers. Um, and again, at this point, the British are the ones who are kind of out in front. Um, it's a very famous saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire. Um, and this was literally true. This is a map of the British Empire at its height, and you can see um, there are literally colonies on every continent. Um, in North America, in Canada, and the 13 colonies, you have territory in Guyana in South America, you have different colonies set up throughout Africa, you have India in Asia, you have Australia, and then um, the British actually make a claim on part of Antarctica, although those claims aren't currently recognized. Um, and as well as as many islands in the South Pacific and in the Caribbean. Um, so this was literally true. The sun would never set on the British Empire. Britain, in many ways, controlled um, every corner of the globe. They are the main superpower, the same way the United States is the world's top superpower today. That's what Britain was in the 19th century. And this would have been a point of great pride for, for members of the British Empire, not only for people who lived in Britain, but also for British subjects. So, for example, Canadians growing up at this time, um, in the early 1900s, this would have been a, um, a great point of pride. You were part of something bigger. You were part of the British Empire. It was a point of pride, um, something greater than yourself. And we still see many of those vestiges of, of our British heritage today. So, for example, having the Queen as our head of state still. Um, you would have definitely seen a, a, a much a much more British society going back a hundred years in Canada, um, and that's this pride in the British Empire is what plays a big role in it. So this slide here, what, what we're looking at is this concept which went along with um, this. This was kind of the economic driving force behind colonialism at the time. This idea of mercantilism. So, so mercantilism is an economic theory that was um, dominant in Europe at the time, and it promoted the government's regulation of a nation's economy um, in order to augment the state's power at the expense of rival nations' power. So it really sees the world economy as a zero-sum game. Um, I benefit and you don't benefit. Um, and so what this diagram here at the bottom is looking at is how um, empire and colonies uh, play into this. So your colonies, you use them, you exploit them for raw materials, you bring them back to your motherland. Um, in the motherland, you turn those into manufactured goods, and then you have markets, your colonies, to sell them back to. 
the idea is this is going to make your you know, your mother country, your empire, more successful. And so from the viewpoint of a European, um, this is seen as very favorable. Um, it makes you more money. It means that you're exporting more than you're importing. It's a favorable balance of trade. And again, you have these markets for your um, for your products. So you're able to extract these natural resources in the mother country. You then turn those into finished goods. Uh, again, this is also during the uh, the height of the Industrial Revolution. So you have lots of factories pop popping up across Europe. Um, this creates jobs for people. You have the emergence of the middle class at this time. There's economic prosperity. And then you have your markets to sell those goods back to. And it's the cycle. And the idea is that it's benefiting. Everyone benefits. The mother country benefits at the end. And again, this cartoon is just kind of playing on this. And you can see here, again, uh, this is Queen Victoria here. Um, and she's being fed on a silver platter all these these goods from her colonies, the gold and silver, the food, the raw materials. You know, it, 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 it's this it's this idea. This is what's making our our colony, our empire rich and prosperous. And again, here you can sort of see this idea of the power dynamic at play between the colony and the colonizers. And this cartoon is, is quite clearly showing this power dynamic. The colonies are literally the servants of the queen. That's their purpose. That's their role, is to serve the mother country, uh, to make the mother country greater. And so in the 1800s, uh, as I alluded to, um, Africa is sort of the main playing ground where this is taking place, the scramble for Africa. And so during this time, again, the main European powers, they're competing for control of Africa. They're competing for control. They want control of those resources. They want control of those populations. They want to create new markets to spread business to. Um, and it's this idea that if you want to be a main player, if you want to be a major player, that prestige of having an empire, so, for example, during this time, uh, so Germany, uh, Germany was unified uh, in the mid 1800s, um, became the Germany that we all know today. Uh, they relate to the whole imperial game. They didn't have colonies in other parts of the world, so there was definitely this push in Germany that if we want to be taken seriously as a global power, we need to start expanding into Africa. We need colonies to make us prosperous. It was seen as something you needed to be taken seriously on the world stage. Uh, and again, it's viewed as a race. It's a zero-sum game. If we're not winning, that means we're losing. You can't sit out on the sidelines. And so just some quick stats about um, what the scramble for Africa looked like. Um, these are kind of the main players there. So, so Britain controlled about 30% of Africa's population during this time. France controlled about 15%. Germany, 9%. Belgium, 7%. They had territory in the Congo here. Congo is actually bigger than Belgium itself is, uh, and Italy had um, a few small territories in, in, in eastern Africa, um, controlling about 1% of the population. But again, this is, from the European perspective, it's a great thing, but it's viewing people in these colonies in, in literally uh, dehumanizing ways. So this is just one example. Um, this, during this time, you would have had these things called human zoos. Um, where people from Africa were brought back to Europe and put in exhibits in museums um, for people to view. Um, so again, literally dehumanizing them. Literally, this is the way that they view people in their colonies. They're not equals. They are lesser. Um, and this is just one way that it sort of manifested itself. Now, the imperial system, it really wasn't sustainable. Um, again, viewing the world as a zero-sum game, you're going to run into many conflicts. Um, so this was conflict between empires as well as between empires and natives. So for example, um, in terms of uh, conflicts between empires and natives, the British were in conflict with the Zulu in South Africa versus the Maori in New Zealand. Uh, and then we could look at the Indian Wars in the U.S. Um, America doesn't like to think of itself as a colonial power at this time. Um, but in many ways, the way that they um, exert their influence um, 
both domestically in terms of their relationship with native populations, as well as in the Caribbean, um, they acted a lot like a colonial power. Um, so the way that they treated Indians, uh, native Indians at this time, um, definitely goes in line with what the European powers were doing. And then uh, you have conflicts between empires. So for example, the Boer War in South Africa, and then uh, imperialism is one of the driving forces behind World War I. And so by the end of World War II, this is what the colonial map looks like. Um, today, there are very, there's a few small islands, which are still, we could look at as colonies. Um, so all this area, all of Africa almost, um, India, some parts of South America, um, these all become independent uh, post-World War II. And again, these are young nations overall. These are less than 100 years old. This is a relatively new phenomenon. And there's a sustained push for decolonization. Um, the reasons for this, um, again, you have this idea that if a nation wants to be independent, they have the right to be. The idea of self-determination. It was really important uh, post-World War I, but it was really only applied to European powers. So, for example, um, the Poles. They wanted a homeland. So you had Poland established. In Eastern Europe. Um, this wasn't an option for uh, colonies in Africa, for example. So you can see there are some of the racial dynamics to this. Post-World War II, though, there's this um, there's a push for any uh, any colony that has this desire to be independent, they should have that right. Um, and so this is when we start to see this idea of the nation-state model dominating global politics. Um, this is what we see today. It's the switch from empires to the nation state. Um, and again, today with our 190 some odd countries, that's, that's the model that we live with. And you start to see these old colonial powers losing control of their colonies. You have nationalist movements beginning in these countries. So for example, um, here's Gandhi and Jinnah, who were um, nationalist leaders in India at the time. Uh, Jinnah was a leader of the Muslim League, um, eventually becoming, um, we have India divided into India and Pakistan. Um, Gandhi, the leader of the Hindu uh, Hindu nationalists. And then here, this, this man here is Nasser, who was the uh, leader of Egypt, um, very uh, a very big player in the Suez Canal crisis after he nationalized the canal, uh, leading to conflict with, with Britain and France, who might have uh, talked about this in your in your grade 10 history class. Now again, even though we've moved past um, the imperial paradigm, it doesn't um, dominate global politics today. It still has a pronounced effect on the world today. Um, so I just want to talk briefly about this idea of post-colonialism. Now this is an academic discipline that examines the legacies of colonialism. So it's looking at things that are still happening today and how colonialism has affected them. Um, and this is a multidisciplinary discipline. Um, you could do post-colonial studies of history. You could do post-colonial studies of literature. You could do post-colonial studies of film. It's just a way of looking at different issues and a way of looking at the world. So for example here, the idea of um, how we appropriate culture. Uh, so this picture on the left here, an appropriation of native native cultures to make a costume, so so non-native people dressing up as natives, um, as opposed to an appropriate use of it, which would be a native person using those, uh, you know, ceremonial dress for for its intended purposes. And then again, this this plays into certain controversies that we see today. So um, in the sports world, a big controversy right now is using native peoples as mascots. So, for example, a big controversy is, is, you know, the Washington Redskins name and logo. Is it an appropriate use? Is it respectful or is it racist? Um, here in, in Peel, in Peel District, um, there was actually a, a, a uh, this summer, a couple of, uh, of high schools actually changed their mascots uh, because of this. There was uh, the, the Chincuzzi Chiefs became the Chincuzzi Timberwolves and the Port Credit Warriors, they changed their, their mascot to, uh, to be, it used to be a native mascot, and they've changed that now. Um, so again, 
there's this push. Uh, there, there are certain as certain people who, uh, who, are, who are still holding on to this. Again, there, there are many examples. We're starting to see more and more uh, sports teams changing their names from, from native imagery and native mascots uh, uh, to more uh, culturally sensitive ones. So just one last point that I'm going to get into here. Um, this ties into a reading that you're going to be doing. Um, it's this idea of a progress trap. So Ronald Wright, uh, he's a historian, um, he came up with this idea uh, as part of his uh, 2004 Massey Lecture series. Um, and according to, to, to Wright, a progress trap is the condition human societies experience when in pursuing progress, through human ingenuity, they inadvertently introduce problems they do not have the resources or political will to solve, for fear of short-term losses in status, stability, or quality of life. This prevents further process and sometimes leads to collapse. So it's kind of this idea of uh, you're taking one step forward and two steps back, this idea of technology or a different way of looking at the world that it, it lets you take, it's this allure that lets you take one step forward, but it, it, it has a downside that pushes you back. Um, I would argue this is kind of a pessimistic way of looking at the world, um, but it has it has some interesting applications, and you're going to be reading more about them uh, in a reading this week. So just to give you a couple examples of this, ways we could apply this. So one would be uh, to apply this to residential schools. So again, um, in Canada in the 1800s, um, residential schools were, were introduced as a way to assimilate Native peoples into uh, to become more European. You can see here in this picture, the boy on the left, this is him before he goes off to residential school, uh, and then the picture on the right there. Um, and again, he, he's literally been stripped of his culture. Um, he, he, his clothing is different. His hair is different. His posture is different. Um, it's a, it was a way of taking away their culture and taking away their heritage. And again, uh, history has shown us that um, these were not very good places. Um, horrible conditions there, generations of, of abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. Um, natives were treated really badly at these schools, and they had to attend them. But at the time, this would have been seen as progress. The British would have seen this as a good thing. Um, they were civilizing the natives. That's the way they would have interpreted this. They thought they were doing good. But again, it's this, this one step forward, two steps back. Uh, and today we're dealing with a lot of the fallout of residential schools um, and the way that uh, Native peoples in Canada um, st are still disadvantaged in our society in many ways. A second example here um, is the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, again, at the time, this would have been viewed as a great thing. It, it's, a, it's, again, tying in with this idea of mercantilism, that it's making uh, European powers more prosperous, um, but really uh, it obviously has a lot of uh, horrible effects on people, um, namely the slaves that were uh, used as free labor uh, as a result of it. It's only seen, it was only seen by the Europeans uh, economically, though. It's, there's an economic benefit to this. It's making us more prosperous, again, ignoring the human impact um, and, and the generations of, of, of <clears throat> the generations of abuse that went on, and again, the lasting legacies of racism that we see today. So in summary, uh, today we learned that colonialism is the expansion of empire to control resources, expand markets, and gain prestige. We learned that the first wave of colonialism started in the late 15th century when Europeans colonized the New World. The second wave began in the 19th century when Europeans expanded their empires into Africa and Asia. We learned that decolonization began following World War I and II, and that finally the legacies of colonialism are still felt today in the developing.